Hello and welcome to Miss Hannah Loves Grammar. In this video we'll be concentrating on the poem A Song, Absent From Thee by John Wilmot, the second Earl of Rochester. So, Rochester's father had been incredibly loyal to King Charles II and that gave young Rochester a lot of benefits. He was given a tutor and a pension with which he travelled the continent. Yet by the time he was an adult, he had the reputation as the wickedest man in England and was considered to be wild. From his range of mistresses to his heroic adventures, he was famous. His life was decadent and full of drama and he experienced both the intellectual and the physically challenging. From collecting his degree at Oxford to joining the Navy to fight the Dutch, he was both a worldly man of wisdom, but also a world of wit that he loved to write of. According to Andrew Marvell of To His Coy Mistress, an earlier video of ours, he considered Rochester to be the best of English satirists. Maybe a bit humble about himself, some might say. Yet, Rochester's talents were very satirical in every sense. He never shied from making very brutal comments, and that's something that echoes throughout this poem, actually. At one point, in his life, he wrote a text called The History of Insipids that specifically condemned the rule of Charles II. Charles II, who, as you know already, had been so generous to him and his father. Perhaps this is because Charles II was famously known as the Merry Monarch for his hedonistic approach to life. But when the chips were down, our man Rochester really knew how to cause a stir and sensation. By the age of 31, Rochester died. But before he died, he converted to Christianity and demanded that all his lewd writings be burnt. That definitely seems to contrast completely to the style of writing that he concentrated on across his life. His lewd writings did indeed focus on his obsession with passion and sexual intimacy. And something that we see within this poem, which is a speaker really questioning uh, what what is to happen with their love now that they will be fleeing and they will have to stray and go elsewhere. When we look at the title, A Song Absent From Thee, we definitely see the self-indulgent style that has many metaphysical overtones of others that we've already considered, be that the scrutiny to his coy mistress or even the flea. It's the grandiosity of the title. More than that, the brackets with this title add to our priority. As a reader, I think we are meant to see a song. The big thing is the song. But in brackets, oh yeah, this is about missing you. The traditional form that's used across this poem of the Restoration Song was very well known. A contemporary reader would instantly recognise it. Yet this is being made comic. Some would say even bawdy. So from the off, a reader might expect this to be offensive as it has quite a sarcastic tone. Absent from thee I languish still. Then ask me not when I return. The straying fool will twelve plainly kill. To wish all day, all night to mourn. Dear, from thine arms then let me fly, That my fantastic mind may prove The torments it deserves to try, That tears my fixed heart from my love. When wearied with a world of woe, To thy safe bosom I retire, Where love and peace and truth does flow, May I contented there expire. Lest once more wandering from that heaven, I fall on some base heart unblessed, faithless to thee, false, unforgiven, and lose my everlasting rest. From stanza one, the word that really catches our attention is the word languish. It simply means to become weak or forced to remain in a really unpleasant situation. And it's interesting, this is about him leaving the lover he is speaking to, to go and stray with others. 
yet his concentration, in fact, is all on himself. I think by the time we get into the second line, I think it's interesting. Why does the speaker not want to be asked when he will return? It ties into a major theme across this poem. Just like with other metaphysical poets, he will stray. There is no doubt about that. And he doesn't want any questions asked. By the end of this stanza, the play on words there, to wish all day, all night to mourn. If the person he is speaking to intends to wait for our speaker, they will be waiting all night to the morn. But the pun there of mourn, spelt M-O-U-R-N, like when you've lost a loved one, it will be their suffering. Maybe it's implied, not his. Interestingly enough, already the use of I several times in this stanza really ignites our understanding. This is a selfish speaker. By the start of the second stanza, we really feel a superficiality to the word dear. It's a romantic cliche, it's a passionate exclamation, but in light of what he's just said in the first stanza, it definitely feels superficial and false. In fact, the expression, let me fly from thine arms, it's as if he feels like he's being held back by the person he's speaking to. Our speaker is even more interesting when they talk about my fantastic mind may prove. The alliteration of my fantastic mind may prove is interesting. It's this self-indulgence again of listen to me, I'm so wise. But more importantly, the capitalization of fantastic, it emphasizes the way that his dreams are idealized. But the word fantastic as spelt like that can also mean you're quite moody and almost at the mercy of your emotions. Additionally, we really get the sense here that this, if this is love, it's pain. His mind may prove to show him that the torments he deserves to experience will happen. If love is pain here, we are questioning as readers, why does his mind deserve these torments? What is happening here? By the sort of final line of this stanza, it's quite aggressive language. We've moved from torments to now tears his fixed heart from his love, my love. That violent separation of where he wants to be and where he will be, yet again, is an echo to other things we've seen met with metaphysical poets. He has no control. It's out of his hands. As experienced with the use of I in the first stanza, here we have many mys repeated throughout this stanza. And the littering of that possessive personal pronoun emphasises the selfishness of our speaker. By the time we read on to the third stanza, we see this develop even further. That bombardment of alliteration there, when wearied with a world of woe. He knows he will stray, but yet again, we really feel sorry for him because he seems to believe he will inevitably lack satisfaction with others. And in fact, he will return to her safe bosom. Yet again, as I've already mentioned, it's very similar, isn't it, to others like the scrutiny into his coy mistress. He has no control. It's out of his hands. But most pertinently within this stanza, I love the way that Rochester conflicts fidelity as a sense of imagery against that of infidelity. So the fidelity there is capitalised one way or another, be that bosom. It's the safety of something pure. And yet the capitalisation of love, peace and truth. He will return to her where those things are. But then the contrast is the infidelity of the world, of the woe which is capitalised that the world will bring upon him.
I think it's an interesting choice of language in the final line of this stanza. May I contented there expire. He's actively wishing it, not choosing it. May I? Not will I, may I? Sorry, I feel like I, I might be repeating myself in an overly ambitious way, but yet again, he feels he has no control. <laughs> More than anything, the word expire in that line. I love its ambiguity. Which way is he going with this? He can breathe easily. That's what it normally means. Does it mean that he'll die fulfilled? Or perhaps it suggests that he's going to climax sexually and be in a place of joy. Regardless, that ambiguity makes him seem powerless in a different kind of way. It's part of his argument. Lest once more wandering from that heaven. The word lest implies just in case. So here we are, we're juggling not just the romantic cliches, but also religious. And that image of heaven there, associated perhaps with true love, well, he might be wandering from that, so straying again. But this time, it's as if he's aware of the consequences. I fall on some base heart unblessed. To me, it's returning to the idea of sin and almost connotes the implication being catching an STI or something dark. That sense it's unblessed anyway. Here it feels that love is an accident. Uh, fall, if you fall. But then potentially it's another romantic cliche of falling in love. I don't know, it's, it's an echo of something we've heard before with this. Interestingly though, the repetition of that harsh F sound seems almost cursed like in, in this faithless to thee, false, unforgiven. There's no escaping it. It's as if our speaker knows the consequence of all that he will do, even if he's not in control is going to make him hate himself. The most pertinent thing about this poem is how it ends. It's ambiguous and it's powerful for that reason and lose my everlasting rest. So the final cons consequences seem quite clear. He loses the joy of being with his true love in the truest of sense by being of f fidelity and you know honesty and frankness but also he loses his place in heaven. This might not feel like such a big deal to us today, but the readership of this poem were deeply religious to their core. So the idea that he's questioning losing his place in heaven makes us question, well, who is our speaker talking to? One critic's considered he might actually be talking to a prostitute or he might be talking to God, and the fact that there is no clarity on who the speaker is talking to makes this poem a masterpiece. Also, I find it rather remarkable that this speaker never questions that his lover might reject him. Yet again with our metaphysical poets, this consistent affection for him is expected so self-indulgent. As mentioned earlier, this is a standard restoration song. It would have had an ABAB -A -B form and be formed into quatrains, so verses of four lines. And it had iambic tetrameter. That's what's often used in songs because it's referred to as a simple and sincere set of messages that can be conveyed through that form. Yet, as we already know, he uses a traditional form to offend and be comedically bawdy with it. Yes, this would shock contemporary readership, but ultimately the success of this poem is its ability to be ambiguous and load up the religious and the romantic cliches to make us question how sincerely this speaker really cares about the implications of his debauched acts.